Okay, we're gonna go ahead and start with our big crowd. Oh, there we go, we have one more person, awesome. Uh, so today's book is Seller Be Sold. Uh, there we go, Seller Be Sold by Grant Cardone. Uh, I loved this book, loved it. I'm gonna read it, I think I'm gonna read it once a month or listen to it once a month. I got so much out of it and again, not that any of it's rocket science, but it's great reminders. So I'm just going to dive in. I did get a couple, an email from, from Sean who shared his take from the book, and I'll read that, but he can't be here today. So um, the first couple chapters talks about committing to sales. So we're going to skip that because all of us pretty much commit to sales. That's our job. But I think that this he wrote this book for people who have an aversion to selling. So <clears throat> the first couple of chapters are, hey, whether you like selling or not, everyone's in sales every day. We're selling our spouses, we're selling our kids, we're selling, we're selling our bosses. So we don't really need to talk about that. I'm gonna jump into the stuff after that. So the first thing that he dives into is commitment. And he said that you need to be committed in what you want to do, which I, uh, you know, 100% believe. He tells a story about how he was working on a rig out in the water and they caught a bunch of fish or something or lobsters. I'm not sure what it was. And they, he said, Hey, can I, I don't know if they were going to throw them away because, you know, it was the end of the day and they didn't sell them. And he goes, I'll take them. And he literally went door to door to door or he went to a busy street corner and he said, I was committed because in two hours, that fish or lobsters or whatever he was selling was, was going to stink and not be valuable anymore. So he was committed to the sense of urgency. And he, he said he ended up making what he would make in a month on the rig. And, and he was questioning the reader, how often are you committed to what we do for a living? And he goes on later to talk about how how much are you sold on the product that you're selling? And if you have any hesitancy with the product or um, what, you know, being a salesperson, that's a problem. And, and, and basically he said, you need to start there being committed to the thing you're selling. Whether uh, I was coaching someone yesterday who's looking for a job and this person does not have a long uh, deal sheet. So, and she had two interviews lined up. And I said to her, she happened to have um, participated in the Canvassing Club Challenge where she had, you know, canvassed 500 people in, in 30 days, 31 days. So I said, I think that you need to focus in the interview, not on your deal sheet, which we know is weak, but focus on the fact that you have zero fear in picking up the phone and drumming up business for vacancies. And probably both companies that you're interviewing with have senior vet veterans who probably have listings and have product, but aren't, you know, they've been in the business 20 years and aren't prospectors. So your value for you to sell in those interviews is the fact that in August, over 31 days, you prospected over 496 people and have no fear in doing that and, she, and commit to that. Because the, the challenge was she was very nervous because she felt very insecure that her deal sheet was weak. And I said, let's turn that around and not focus on the deal sheet. Let's focus on what your strength is and commit to that. So we role played that and um, she got, she's moving on with both companies to a second interview. So she walked into those interviews a heck of a lot more confident because she was committed to selling that strength of hers. So, um, so committing, and I think a lot of times um, I, I talked to another person this week, her goal, one of her goals for 2021 is to improve the listings she's getting. So she has listings, but they're C and D level listings. 
and she wants to get A and B level listings. And I said the same thing to her is you need to commit to filling those C and D listings and then using that success story, those case studies to propel you to get the C and B listings and then the B and A listings. But committing and not being, you know, one foot in and one foot out. You know, the grass is always greener. You can't do that. You have to commit to the thing that's in front of you that you're selling. Um, and then he says, commitment equals results and then results equals happiness. He then talks about um, recording. He said, when I, once I committed, I decided that I was going to be the best. And what he started doing, which I don't think we can do this, but he started recording his phone calls so I don't think we can do that legally. And making notes of every exchange I had with customers. I started looking at the patterns that were being created. I had an objection notebook. I wrote down every customer objection. And then later on, I would study my notes to see that most of the customers were making the similar comments. My awareness was raised and I was able to come up with solutions brainstorm with others and role play. He said, once a customer would tell me something, I would write it down. Um, and I began, began observing and taking responsibility for what was happening to me. And I was able to predict what they would say. He said, um, the quicker I did this, I had more control because I knew what was coming. I had created responses and my production double, almost doubled from the simple action of the observation. And his confidence soared because he knew what was coming. A lot of our insecurity comes from, I don't wanna go into a meeting because I'm not sure what they're gonna say and I don't know what to say in response. So that I don't think we should be recording phone calls but I think we could be, while we're on phone calls or in meetings, I'm a big, huge believer in note taking, even in meetings. People say, you know, is that respectful? I think it's very respectful to take notes in meetings because I think people, I like it when students come visit me. I like it when they take notes because A, they're not going to ask me to repeat myself or ask the question again. And it makes the person feel important that you're taking the notes, I think. So, um, so I, I used to do that a lot. You know, I've shared with you guys my, uh, uh, what's the word, process of when I get a new project, I have two columns. And on the left column is all of the benefits of my property. That it's got a lot of traffic, that the restaurant sales are high, that it's got great visibility, whatever the positives are. And then on the right hand column, what question can I ask the prospect where he will answer, you know, my benefits? Because <clears throat> if they say it, it's true. If we say it, it, we're just used car salespeople. So, for example, when people do sign calls or uh, in like you know, mostly sign calls, because when you're prospecting, it's a different you know, you're in a different position. So if someone calls on the sign, my favorite question to ask is why did you call on the property? And that's when they go, they tell me the litany of things they like on the property, which then helps me when later on, when they're seeing the space, usually the number one question on some of my properties are, we love the traffic. And then when we get to the property, the biggest objection, which is usually false objection is, you know, there's no parking. They don't really care about the no parking, but they feel like they've got to give an objection. <clears throat> they, um, he talks about committing and being almost cultish. I don't know if you guys saw this morning, I posted about Lululemon. So my son's girlfriend just got a job at Lululemon as a seasonal worker. She's had five days of three and a half hour trainings about the pants and the fabric and the stitching. <laughs> She's like, she gets off these calls and, you know, she says, I am, you know, I, I'm cross-eyed. But then she goes, I get $400 a month to buy the men in my life Lululemon products. I said, you mean you have to spend 400 and you get a discount? She goes, no, I get $403 to buy my dad, my brother, Alex, 
my boyfriend Lululemon products because they want to build up the men following for Lululemon. And I go, well, do you get any free money? She goes, no, but I get a 40% discount. She goes, but you know what else I get? And I said, what? She goes, I get $125 a month uh, free reimbursement when she brings in a receipt that she goes and takes a hot yoga class or a CrossFit. They pay them to go work out and sweat. So they have a cult-like following with customers. And now I see that they have a cult-like following with their employees. So committing, you know, he t tells a story. He says, you know, Alexander Graham Bell was considered a lunatic when he was talking about inventing a device that would transmit the, hu the human voice over long distance through wires. You know, how many people thought uh, Tess, uh, Musk, Elon Musk was a lunatic, right? And then be so thoroughly sold on your product that your conviction is irresistible to others. So I know it's hard if you have a C or D asset that you're trying to lease or sell to be so that your conviction is irresistible to others, but you got to figure out, you know, what that is. Like we have, we have a center that's renovated and beautiful. And then one right next door, that's not renovated but it's the one that's closest to the college. So I'm always talking about the 30,000 students right across the street that walk over to this center. So I'm, I, I hope my, my confidence is contagious with my um, confidence that they will have traffic from the school across the street. My son works at Lego. He's a Lego fanatic. So when he sells the Lego products, I th definitely think when I read this, you know, be so thoroughly sold on your product that your conviction is irresistible to others. That defines Alex in his Lego job. Um, he talks a lot about how price is never the issue. Price is never the issue. He says, um, you know, and, 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 he talks in the same chapter, the chapter six called the price myth. He talks about always agreeing with the customer. So I, I do this, Chloe sees this all the time. You know, I quote $55 a square foot. Oh my gosh, that's ridiculous. That's so high. Absolutely. We're, we're the highest in the market. Agree with the customer and it takes all of the wind out of their sales. Um, you know, he says, if price was the issue, why would people stand in line for a $4 cup of coffee and buy a $2 bottle of water? He says, how many times have you paid for something that was more than you could afford and you loved it? You know, I talk on LinkedIn about my first cassette, uh, uh, what's it called? Packs, cassette pack of my Tom Hopkins. I definitely, I put it on a credit card. It was more than I was making probably a month. I wore those cassettes out. To this day, I still use things I learned from that original first cassette deck of um, self-improvement. And it started me on this self, you know, improvement passion that I have. But I think we've all bought things as a consumer that was more than we wanted to spend. So it's, it's all about what are the important things that the client and the customer is looking for and addressing those. Um, not, and not, and they might be talking about price, but nine times out of 10, price is not the issue. What my little trick that I do when they talk about, oh my God, you know, Chloe just signed her first deal. It was a bowl, acai bowl and juice concept. We were standing in front of this space 45 triple net. And they're like, this is, it's just so much money. We can't afford this. This also happened with our schmooshed ice cream and cookie and alcohol tenant. That's, that was 55 triple net. And in both situations, I said, no problem. You know, I agree it's very expensive, but I have a solution. I've got another center that's 10, in both situations, the ice cream guy, I said, I've got another center that's $10 less at 45. And then the other center, I said, I've got another center that's $10 less at 35. 
do you want to go see the other center? And both situations are like now, I mean, the, the acai bowl guy said, yeah, let's go over and take a look. That was the center that was not renovated. He pulls up, he goes, I don't want this. I go, okay, well, the other one is 45 and I'm not negotiable. He goes, no problem. We'll take it. It had nothing to do with the price, but we are inundated in our entire life, whether it's by parents or teachers or bosses to say, everyone negotiates, we all need to drop our prices. That's the number one issue. And it rarely is the number one issue. I'm gonna shut up for a second. Greg, have you ever had a situation where they said price was the issue, but it wasn't the issue? I mean, every lease that we deal with, it's always <laughs> the price issue. And you know, you 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 show them like like you just described. You will either show them a different property in the market, or we'll show them a different space in the pro in the mall. Um, it's it, it's never an issue. And, and you it is. And, and what I like about Grant is, is that he will he, he his preparedness, his 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 education to preparedness and trying to figure out what is the right solution to this specific pro client is good. Um, and, and, and that's really where it comes to. It's, it's, it's knowing your process is cold and knowing what the true objections are going to be. Cause you know, prices, price is going to come up. It is what it is. And, you know, I have dealt with this. I mean, actually a guy that was probably my best retailer um, price was his number one question. We got, we got price out of the way a long time ago and he overpaid for, and he overpaid for a space. I guaranteed he did. Um, but he likes it. And he's got four locations in the property and um, pre COVID he was doing just fine. You know, we got over the rent part quickly because I told him what he needed to do, how to, how to operate and really gave him that extra value that overcame the price, the price hurdle. Right. I, you know, we're, we're hopefully sending out a lease to, or we sending out execution copies of a lease today, Chloe and I, and um, we're in, I'm in the meeting with the guy and, and I said, he goes, well, what's the price? I said, it's 35 triple net. And he goes, well, you can negotiate. I said, no. He goes, well, that's really high. I said, yeah. He goes, well, I said, how much? And then I, and then I said, what, what do you do in this? He, we were in his other location. I said, what do you do here? He goes one, I think he's, I can't remember if he said one, two or one eight. He, I think let's, let's say he said one, two. I said, okay, one, two, can you do one, two in that location? He goes, I think I can do more. I said, okay, well, let's just go with the one, two. I said, what are you paying rent here? He told me. So we calculated it and I think he was paying 14% of sales. I said, okay. And then I did R35 at one, two. And I said, okay, so you, you'll, you'll be paying less than 14% here. I said, what else do we need to talk about? <laughs> you know, like, let's move on. It's, it wasn't about price, you know, and I think the guy was sold on it before, you know, I, I mean, at 80, he wouldn't have taken it, obviously, but he had been looking in the, I said, I said, to, and then I came back around, he goes, well, I can't believe you, you, we won't, you won't negotiate a little bit. And then I said, you told me you've been looking in this location for two years. He said, I have been, I said, okay, so how, so you've done your research in the market. He said, yes. I go, am I not the cheapest in the market? This is the center that's not renovated. And he goes, you are. I go, well, I'm not, nego I'm not negotiating on the price. So the, in the end, I ended up dropping the deal a dollar because they went in with their architect and remeasured. And you know how this is. I don't know if you guys deal with this. When you acquire a shopping center, you acquire what the prior person says is the square footage. I never remeasure the spaces. We've got years and years and years of cam reconciliations. We're never, you're never, I never change the square footage. I know it's different in mall in malls, Greg, but you never do it in strip centers. And um, so in the end, he I said, Well, your architect didn't do it versus, you know, by BOMA standards. And he goes, Okay. So they went back out there and did it BOMA standards, and it was still less. And I'm like, I'm not, I'm like, I'm not reducing the square footage. You've got ex outdoor patio that I'm not charging you on. I'll drop it a buck a square foot. When are we signing the lease? And yeah. the issue went away. So right. I did negotiate a little bit because I just didn't want to hear it, you know, and, and he didn't come back and say, well, you should drop it on the cam too, but he didn't, thank goodness.
but, Love but yeah. You, are, you guys brought this up because Beth, you mentioned at the beginning, you know, that this book is tailored towards people who don't sell, sell and, you know, don't like selling and you guys are, but I am not, I'm not a salesperson. I'm not. Um, and honestly, I probably wouldn't have read the book had it not been for this. Um, but I do have to say that was one of the things that really, uh, I really took from it because when you think about selling, you think about selling somebody something they don't want or don't need or that instead of selling them what they do need. Right. And, and he talks about this a bit, you know, don't just, you know, don't just fixate on, on what it is you want to sell them, listen to them, pivot. And if you have other products that you can, that meets their, their needs better go for that. And it's like that his approach of like listening, the customer service, uh, uh, feedback type of loop that you're creating the customer needs to be important needs to be the most critical aspect not just the product or the products the least important aspect because you're selling the customer than yourself um that whole thing kind of changed the 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 relationship i have with the understanding of selling oh really i'm so that. glad yeah and i mean you understanding that that we're we're all in some sort of selling capacity whether you are working, you know, you're, you're selling yourself to your kids. I mean, in, in every conversation and in every interaction that you have during the day, you could be selling yourself to your dog. You could be selling yourself to your significant other. You could be selling yourself to the neighbor down the street. You're all in some selling capacity. And, you know, I, I think flipping the conversation to trying to persuade, pushing your, into, you know, your intentions onto somebody versus listening to them. I think that that is the, the basic premise to get out of this book. Um, you know, you know, Beth and I, Beth, we, we talked about this before, you know, Grant isn't for everybody. Right. Um, but I think, and, and he, and, you know, you can tell why in this book of, of why he's not for everybody, but there are, there are nuggets in here that I think are extremely beneficial to understand and you can you can drill down further. There's certainly other books in this in, in, that that you can drill further. But I think that's that's the basic premise out of here. Is just like you're you're always selling, and understanding put the customer first, you know. And doesn't matter if you're interviewing for a job, you're you're talking with your kids, you're going to the grocery store, whatever it is, you are in you are always in some sort of selling capacity, all day every day. Yeah. Look, I mean, I know people. He's not everyone's cup of tea. I love him. Gary Vaynerchuk's not everyone's cup of tea. I love him. Two completely different guys, right? But um, I think that Grant has committed his, his career and has made gazillions of dollars by understanding and a deep diving on sales. You know, I've been in his office where he's got, you know, uh, uh, like a call center set up with 30 guys and right in the corner up on the up elevated from the ceiling is um, like a ticker of each desk, the number, how many calls they've made in the last hour, how many calls they've made that day. I mean, it is very competitive, very, you know, he's in there at their desks, making cold calls, like the stuff you see on the videos, I've seen him do in person. Every morning they have a 15 minute rah-rah meeting where they're rewarding the people that made big deals the day before. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Amazing. And I understand that he's not everyone's cup of tea. Um, he, he um, has this whole, uh, in chapter seven, he talks about second money is easier than first money, which I love. I'm not really sure how it could work with us in leasing space. I do know that it can work with me with training. So I'm going to try it, but I love, but it's, but I know when he, when I, I was listening to the book and I know absolutely that that has worked on me as a customer, like where someone's selling me, you know, blinds for my house and then they upsell me like the second money uh, a lot easier because I've already committed and then by committing to something more, it validates my first commitment, which psychologically, you know, I think I stopped and rewound it two or three times, but I think very interesting. 
Very interesting. You know, maybe for Greg, if you get one guy, a guy that wants to do a key, a kiosk or, you know, what, an art, whatever you want to RMU, can you get them to do a second one? I don't know, but I, I loved that. I loved that idea that psychologically people will buy more because it, they're individually rationalizing the first purchase. And it's happened to me as a person, as a buyer. So he's right. Um, he talks about how we're in the people business. You know, he, 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 and this again goes back to price. He says when he lived in LA, his wife and he, and he always went to the same gas station on Sunset Boulevard. The guy would come out, fill up his gas tank. You know, this is in the 90s where that never happened. Fill up his gas tank, cleaned his windshields, and gave him bottles of water. He said, well, am I buying the gas or the service? He goes, I don't even know how much the gas cost. I would never go across the street to the other three gas stations on the corner. I went because I was treated like Ritz Carlton, which he talks about later. Are you Ritz Carlton or are you the Holiday Inn? He said, what can we do to over deliver for our customers? Yeah. I mean, great example. He said, I would never even consider going to another gas station. And think about that. That guy can do that gas station guy maybe doesn't have the volume of customers because of the time commitment that he's putting into each one. But my guess is he's charging more. I don't know. He also tells a story in the book later on about the kid who was selling uh, floor cleaning products like for out cement in front of his house. And he goes, in my neighborhood, you had to get into the development. And then I had a gate that you had to press I'm on a camera, like he goes, the it was a kid, you know, 18, whatever. He said, I just was so impressed that he got into the development and then had no fear going up to the, the little camera dialing. He says, I let him come up. I opened the door. He goes, I've got a home office. I'm busy on calls. I don't need to be interrupted with this kid cleaning, you know, my marble stone in the front, in the front porch. He goes, he opens the door and the kid's kid goes, I, I only need whatever he said, 20 seconds, the kid drops down and starts cleaning these stones at Grant's feet. He's standing at the front door. He goes, not only did I buy the $200 product, I, give, I gave the kid another 200 because I was so impressed with his attention to the, the need of my lack of time and the ability that he got through those two gates. You know, he goes, I had to reward the guy. Yeah. Well, we, what we did, what I, what I would do, and I would do this at, when we were managing malls and, and doing strip centers is if we had a lease, if we were meeting with a lease <clears throat> with an operator uh, for a lease, I would either arrange for valet for them to park their car, or I would dedicate a parking space for them so that they can find, so that they eliminate the hurdle because we know how hard it is to go find a parking space. If, especially if you're in like a busy grocery anchored center, you, you're probably parking out by the road half the time especially when you go there. So I block off a space and, or give them valet and make sure that I give, give them that extra. It didn't cost me anything. It really cost me absolutely nothing. Um, it takes one phone call to security or I go out there and come off a space. And I, when they get there, I pull it out, they pull in and we just, you know, it's just, it's a good way to just, um, it's a good first impression. I am stealing that. You should. Oh absolutely my should. gosh. I can just visualize like a cone that says, you yep. know, VIP prospect. Yep. Oh we my God. Just... I love that. Yeah. Greg, you need to put that on LinkedIn. I will do that. Do that today. I, if you don't, I'm stealing it, but I'll give you credit. Oh, you should put it. Fine. You should I'll, put it. I'll, 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 I'll tag you. I love that idea. Um, so again, the whole agreeing with the customer. Uh, you're right. You're right. It's very expensive. You're right. The cam is high. You're, I constantly say, I agree. I agree. The rent's high. 
Um, I agree that the space is too big. So I do try to give them an option, like the ice cream store that paid the 55, one of the issues was that the space was 1600 and they needed 13 or 1400. I said, I agree, it's too high. I can't help you there. It's, I can't make it smaller, but I have this other center where I have a 1350 at $10 less. By giving them the option of another choice and putting the owner, the onus on them to decide, it takes it off of you. So uh, I do that all the time. Well, I understand that you don't wanna sign a personal guarantee. If I, I remember early on in my career, Tom Hopkins taught this. If, if I were in your shoes, I'd feel the same way. I must have used that a million times. If I were in your shoes, I'd feel the same way. I wouldn't want, want to sign a personal guarantee either, but we require it here or you can give us a nine month security deposit or a letter of, of, of credit equal to blah, blah, blah. Your choice, you decide. So agreeing, agreeing. And, and I would tell you that when I am out canvassing or prospecting or role playing with leasing agents, I would say the number one thing, the number one bad habit I want to correct is making people wrong making people wrong. It's a bad habit. And we all need to get out of that habit. And whether it's because we think we have to overcome the objection, whether we want to show how smart we are, I don't know what it is, but we all need to be careful about that. I just canvassed with a group of people last week. And a couple of times we, when we came out, I said, now, how could we have said that differently to not make the person, like, I think we were in an Asian restaurant, like a, a pho restaurant, and the woman said, um, you know, oh, Weston, yeah, I like Weston. We have a lot of people that come here from Weston, but I can't afford those rents. Those rents are really high. And the person in my group said, yeah, but you can do more sales there than here. So instead of agreeing and then asking a question. So instead I said, wouldn't it have been better if we said absolutely rent super high. And actually when we got back in the car, we role played this. I said, um, but what do you do in, you know, can I, what do you do in sales here? And she said, you know, I said, do you do 50 a month? And she said, we do a little more than that. Okay, great. So now if you can do the same kind of role play that I did earlier, so if you can do 600 a month, what is your rent, da, da, da. And then you, you, you assign that whole formula to this property and this rent and the sales here, then it kind of puts it in perspective. Now, is if you could do the same percentage of uh, rent versus sales at, in Weston, could you afford the high rent? And then the lady says, well, yeah, if I could do... 750 instead of 500, then I could pay that rent and then get her to say it instead of you. We cannot make prospects wrong. I try to, I try that with my kids. I don't get very far though, Greg. Mm. I get yeah. too emotional. And that, you know, he talks about the also later on in the book about emotions. We got to take emotions out. It's not personal, it's not emotional. Um, and we certainly, I was on a call with a national big box retailer earlier this week with a client. She was rude and disrespectful. Uh, it took everything in my power to just not lose it with her and just stay non-emotional because she was just being, it was, it was unfairly, she was taking it out on us and it was... Um, <laughs> Where I get emotional is when I see a retailer just don't care when they don't care. Like that's where I get emotional. And I mean, I, I feel like that's okay. I feel like that's isn't, if I had, if I'm caring more about their business than they are, I think that's the right way to be emotional. I, I'm okay with pointing out where I think they have deficiencies and how they can, but I have to pro provide solutions, how to fix them. Now, if, if a six months later, they don't do it and we've gone through this over and over again, then I'm going to call them on it. I will. And they're going to, they're, they're a target to be replaced at that point, but it's definitely not, you don't want that to be your first interaction. Otherwise right. 
whatever conversation you, you've you've toxic you've you've poisoned the relationship at that point from the beginning right. that you have right. to for sure for sure um i also liked and I never really kind of considered this um, that he talks about in chapter 10, he says, people believe what they see, not what they hear. This was like, I don't think I've ever read this ever anywhere in 34 years. You know, they, they believe what they see. Now I've always been taught they believe what they say, which is why you want to ask the question and get them to say it. But very, very interesting. They believe what they see. So as many proposals or something in flyers, and I have been when I've been canvassing, you know, I have my Sharpie with me and I write down whatever I say. I actually do it because I don't want to forget. <laughs> and I then looked at Chloe if she's with me and like, we got to write what, what I said on the back of their business card. But taking a flyer and saying it's 35 triple net or you'll get six months of half rent, but they believe what they see and not what they hear. Again, I had never ever heard that in any sales training ever. And he has, you know, 10 pages about this. He says, never sell with words, always show documentation. Never negotiate with words, write your negotiations down on paper. Uh, the more data you provide, the better. Don't be afraid to use a lot of data. Keep your information current. Use third-party data as much as possible. I that, absolutely, instead of your data, use third-party data. Have your written information available and easy to access. Um, you know, lo love, love that, love that. Had you ever heard that, uh, Tom? People believe what they see and not what they hear? Yes, but not to that extent. Uh, it's very true. And, and I agree with you having the third party, you know, data as a reference point too. It's a very good point. You know, he talks about, he does a lot of before, you know, in his, in his, in his early years of training, he was known as the car dealership guy, right? Yep. And he said he convinced car dealerships to have, have, when you walk into the car dealership, like if there's a, I don't know how they did this. They couldn't have done this on all the models. I don't remember exactly, but like, here's the Ford truck and here's all the dealerships and listing the prices, which in our, it's like our market studies, right? Having a market study with saying, hey, here's the 10 centers in my market. Here's the market study. Here are the names of the brokers and, the, and their phone numbers. You can't argue, you know, especially if you are a lower rent option and they come out of the gate saying rent is an issue, which we know now it's not. But having that market study, you know, I, I know that I saw one of the leasing agent forum people sent me a flyer recently and on the flyer, they had the market study. And I said, I don't know. Mm -hmm. At the time I said, I've never seen this before and I'm not sure if this is appropriate on the flyer. Uh, so I recommended they take it off the flyer and, they, and I said, just attach it. But it's an interesting idea. The problem is, is you're gonna have to change the flyer a lot because you know prices change you know just today the five centers around me might be quoting x but once they if they lease three spaces each those rents are going higher so but i thought that was you know I, very interesting people believe what they see that's why testimonials are so important i just uh a, a, a one of these um realty network groups called me because they want me to do a, a webinar for their group and they said why they called me was they saw testimonials from other realty groups on my website so they saw someone else giving me uh, a third party testimonial then he talks uh, about giving uh, and this is kind of like what greg said about the parking place which i love he says, if someone asks me for a drink, I get it for them, I open the bottle, I bring them glass, ice, and a napkin. I don't ask them if they want a glass. I don't ask them if they want ice. I go above and beyond. 
Chloe, were you here when Greg said what he does? He, he saves a parking place for prospects when they come to see the space? Ah, we're doing it. Yeah. Um, was... We talked about Holiday Inn or Ritz Carlton, you know, be the service provider like the Ritz Carlton, sending handwritten notes, sending small gifts if you can. Um, service is senior to selling which we just spoke about with um, um, earlier on on this call. And, and then he talks about the hard sell. So this is when it gets, I'm sure, for, for people that are not, that don't love selling, they didn't like this chapter, right? Greg, where he was, he said, be pushy, be persistent, ask again, you know. Yeah, that, that, was, that's where he gets like, and I mean, that's where he kind of gets off the rails, I think, a little bit, in my opinion. Yeah. And if anybody has seen the interview between him and Jordan Belfort, you can see them. They go at it about this with a little bit. Yeah. And um, like I said, it, it's one approach. I think there's many other approaches to, to handle the hard sell. Um, I, I, I think so. He, he kind of contradicts himself a little bit here, I think, for part of the book to hear. So, I mean, I get it. I do. Um that's not me. I'm, I'm not going to be that guy. And, you know, so be it. That's just it, not my personality. It, yeah, it's not me either. But, I, but I, if I'm go going to be honest, I can definitely see where I could be a little more assertive and persistent. Sure. I, I am, I do kind of say, no problem if you're not interested. And I shouldn't do that so quickly. I kind of do, you know, the takeaway close, which I should, I should, I think this, what this did is I agree that I wouldn't be in their face like he is, but it did kind of remind me I'm in selling. <laughs> and he says, look, you have to believe in what you're offering is the right thing for the prospect. So he's not advocating do the hard sell if it's not the right match. But I will tell you this deal we're working on right now with the guy with the square footage, like I, I've been all over Chloe, call, text him, call, call him. Is he, are, we, are we signing the lease today? I'm normally Chloe not like that, right? But I read this book and I thought, you know, I'm gonna put, pick up the pressure. I know the guy wants it. We've agreed to terms, let's get the lease signed. And I'm normally not like that. So I think it's, I do think like what we talk about when we read these books, you don't have to take everything that the author says, but what does the author say to help you add to your toolbox? Yep. And, and, and personally, that's, that's exactly what this does. Right. Personally, I can I can pick it up a little bit. Um, and then he go, he has chapter thirteen talks about massive action. I can't believe we're almost done. See, when I when I like the book, these hours go very, very quickly. Hi, Paul. Hi, Rebecca. Um, you know, he, ta he talks about time and I so believe this. This is probably the number one thing I coach about where people say, I don't have time. I don't have time to canvas. I don't have time to read. I don't have time to, you know, that's, we know, right? Because Greg, you did the exercise of torture with me. We all waste time. All of us. Every year I do the exercise of torture. Every year I find an hour or two of day that I'm wasting me i teach this but um you know he, he's he talks about going out to breakfast going out to lunch you're not going to sell anyone sitting at your desk in your office with your paper bag um you know i've in the last two weeks hosted two groups lunch groups where people some didn't want to come because they were still nervous but i had the first group i had 11 women and last this past week i had 10 women so it's okay if you're too afraid, but there was a case of 21 women wanted to go out to lunch and sit, we sat outside both times, um, but we got a lot, Chloe and I got a lot of ideas sharing with other leasing agents and tenant rep brokers. Yeah. Um, in chapter 21, he goes through the $250,000 prosperity schedule where he talks about getting up at six o'clock, writing your goals, listening, exercising, listening, watching motivational training. He says, wake, I thought this was great. Wake up two, the rule is two hours before you need to be somewhere. 
And that's so interesting because I get up at six and I'm usually out of the house by eight, eight thirty. So I, I follow that. Um, dress for success, eat out, uh, have your short term targets, create your hot list of who you can get in front of today. He's, and I got this idea, which I'm going to do on my LinkedIn live. He says, have a save a deal meeting, pass deals list with a save plan. So on LinkedIn live, so I had done that. Do I want, do you guys want me to do a role play Wednesdays or save a deal Saturdays? And it was pretty dead even 50, 50. So I'm going to do both. I'm going to alternate. And, but I got that. And it was kind of like our, we called it a dead deal meeting before COVID, but I like save a deal better where we met with other people in the area who didn't do a deal. Maybe I can do a deal in my center. Um, follow up on 100% of yesterday's opportunities, call five new clients or five, five, call five new prospects, go out to lunch with a client or a prospect, uh, send out five birthday cards, personal visits, continue to work the phone until day end, go home, be 100% with your loved ones, avoid TV. That would be a problem for me. Uh, and then write your long-term goals again and then try to go to sleep. But, you know, I love that. I love that. And then he has at the end, the 10 commandments of sales, be positive, see the sale, see the sale, be sold on your offer, know your value proposition. That's like what I told you earlier in the call where the woman who's interviewing for the jobs, her value proposition was not her experience and her deal sheet. Her value proposition was she has no problem doing 500 cold calls in 31 days. There's not, a, and that I told her, there aren't a lot of people in the world that can do that. As we all saw with the leasing agent forum, 68 people had the opportunity, 31 signed up and only 13 completed it. Uh, always agree with your client, uh, be time efficient, assume the close and always persist in the close. Uh, we also, I loved in here where he talked about the, um, call reluctance and how it's probably the biggest problem in the sales industry. And I fall victim to it too. Sometimes I'll go, I don't want to call that guy. Like I don't, I've got a guy I need to call in California. I've been needing to call him for two weeks. I, I keep stop. Every time I go to text him or pick up the phone and call him, I think I got to do something, send him something of value first. And I haven't found that thing yet. So I, I'm going to make a note for myself right now that I'm gonna find an article about the California shutdown and then that I'll send that and then I'm gonna call him. Uh, but fill the pipeline. Um, he says, leave a message every time. Leave a voice message every time. I, I haven't always done that. What else? What else, Greg or Tom? Tom, I know you didn't read the book, Greg. Staying motivating. Oh, I love what he said about staying motivated because people ask me this all the time. He says, the best way to stay motivated is to take action and move to the next thing. He goes, "You so what if you get rejected on a deal? Go canvassing, go cold calling. I say that all the time when people go, I'm in a funk, go canvassing, you'll get out of the funk. Staying motivated has to do with you taking action and doing something else. Sitting around moping is gonna make you less motivated. And I mean, he, he talks about too, is like, even if you aren't a funk, you know, go help somebody else. If, yes. if you're, if your deals are falling apart, go help somebody else's deals. You know, you'll, you'll see what they're doing and, and you might be able to learn something from them and how to, you know, what they're doing differently that you're missing, whatever it is, you know, get positivity from there. It's like, you're not, you're not asking for anything. You're just trying to get out of the slump. And, you know, I, I, I love how he ties his business perspective to the professional athlete. I think that that resonates pretty clearly to a lot of people. And I think it would certainly do so with a lot of, you know, we'll call it, you know, younger people in the industry. Um, I think it's just, it's a way to person, it just, just helps give it a more personal perspective. Absolutely. And then the last thing, which again, I haven't done a good job of this. And I, I actually, he had this in another book. I think it was the 10 X rule. And I've tried to do better with it. Again, never heard this in any other training. Get answers to your questions. How many times have you asked a question in a showing and the guy avoids answering the question? 
and I don't push it. So what do you do in sales in your current location? And he changes the subject on me and I don't go back around. I get chicken, you know what? And I don't push it. He says, get the answers to your questions. The person who controls the sale is not the person asking the questions, but the person who can get the answers to the questions. Love it. Anyway, you guys know when I love a book and when I, when I don't love a book. Uh, I hope next month's book is great. I did this, what came as a recommendation. I haven't started it yet. On December 18th, it'll be, it's called The Art of the Start by Guy Kawasaki. So I'm anxious. I've gotten a lot of people um, recommending it. And then the book after that in January, which uh, many people have been asking us to do this one, Start With Why by Simon Sinek. I'm working on the list for 2021. Feel free to send me, if you haven't already, your recommendations. Um, I'm excited that we continue to have uh, I know we only have a few people today on here live, but we're getting like three to 400 downloads of the recording. So I'm, I'm happy that, you know, Greg, who's you've been with me from the start, a lot of people reach out to me and say they've, they're reading more. They're reading oh, more because of the book club and because we keep talking about it, which I love. Um, so a couple announcements today at four o'clock, the freshman forum, everyone's welcome. We have Maria Tulioopoulos, the head VP of strategy for Ulta. So join us and have a wonderful Thanksgiving and be safe and healthy. Thanks guys. You too. We'll see bye. you guys. Thank you. Bye. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy you Thanksgiving. Too. Thanks. Bye-bye.